Hey, what's going on everyone? Today I've got a little greenhouse build action. But, to make things a little more interesting, I decided to add some electronics. So, we've got a temperature controller that can power vent and heat to get us going when the snow is melting and when the leaves are falling. Alright, let's get to the shop. Even though this isn't exactly a router heavy project, that's where we're going to start. Except, we're using it as a joiner. If anyone's not used a router table like this, it's pretty simple. Just place a 1 16th inch spacer behind the left fence and index a straight bit off of that. Boom, mini joiner. And perfect for 1 or 3 quarter inch stock. The cedar boards I'm working with right now will be glued up in just a minute to make the panel that will mount the temperature controller and fan to. For anyone curious why we use a joiner, here's a board edge before and here's a board edge after. After that, I'll go ahead and glue them up. In order to keep them as flush as possible, I'm going to use my Porter Cable Biscuit Joiner and some number 20 biscuits. Truth being told, it probably would have been easier to just buy the boards wide enough, but I did have these on hand and they were made of cedar, so hopefully should hold up a little better outdoors than your run-of-the-mill pine or fir. On the adhesive front, I'm going with Tight Bond 3. This particular brand has never failed me, and this specific product is 100% waterproof when cured. Very important here in Seattle. With our cedar glued up, clamped and drying, I'm going to first begin work on the verticals. I'm going 48 inches tall in the rear with a 10 degree slope towards the front. I'll use my miter saw to cut everything to length. Just as before, I'm going cedar all around. After cutting to length, I'll head over to the table saw and remove the factory radius from one side. I'm doing this because you don't want a flat cut mating to a round one, so we'll take 3 sixteenths of an inch off one side. For reasons that in retrospect feel kind of pointless, I decided to build everything using tongue and groove joinery. This results in a nicer look, but increases the build time by about 300%. Hindsight being 2020, and if I still was stuck on the idea, I'd just bite the bullet and buy a matched router bit set. That would help keep the table saw free for ripping and save me the hassle of constant blade changes. This particular set is from Harbor Freight, and it's decent. It's not as nice as a Freud, but it's half the price, so that's nice. Before cutting the tongues, I'm going to cut the grooves on all vertical and horizontal pieces. And hey, if you're just getting into the DIY makerspace and are on the fence about a table or a miter saw, definitely go with the latter. A table saw could do just about everything a miter saw can, but the opposite of that statement isn't true. In order to cut the tongues on our horizontals, I need to use a sacrificial fence. This is just a scrap piece that's butted tight up against the blade. One thing that's a real challenge with table saw joinery is that you really need to sneak up on the joints. Take a little too much and it's a weak joint. Not enough and you'll crack open the groove. You want the tongue to slide firmly but not tightly. For the very top board, I'm going to rip each horizontal in half. I'm doing this because it won't really be supporting any weight so we can go a little thinner. And, because it's a greenhouse, I'm trying to block as little light as possible with opaque boards. To get the lengths on these, I had to break out a little trig due to that slope. And, full disclosure, I definitely had to hit up Google for this. Sines, cosines, and tangents are not part of my daily vernacular. Back over on my table saw, and I've once again got my sacrificial fence set up. But this time, I need to cut the tongues on an angle. To do that, I'll dial in 10 degrees on my miter gauge and go to town. For the paneling, I'll be using some clear polycarbonate. This material is what makes this project a little bit spendy. Because my saw only has a 20 inch rip capacity and I need 22.5, I had to mark the cuts with a square and then make the cut without a fence. It's cuts like these, the ones with floppy material and that require one to get their digits close to 6500 RPMs of carbide that make me a little nervous. I keep thinking about buying a saw stop, 
but that company's high prices and crony capitalistic behavior are giving me pause. But I guess one trip to the ER would cost more, so maybe it's not the time to be standing one's ethical ground and admit that even though they're scumbags, they will save your hands. Before gluing and clamping, I'm going to transfer all measurements among our vertical pieces. These marks are where the horizontal rails will sit. Transferring instead of remeasuring reduces the chances of error, and when something is glued, there's not much room for that. I guess it should go without saying, but a dry fit is in order. The last thing you want is to find out that something doesn't fit while three other joints have glue setting up. Again, I'll be using Tight Bond 3 for its waterproof nature. To clamp everything while the adhesive sets up, I'm using a pair of parallel clamps. If you don't own any and are on the fence about buying some, I'd say go for it. They are so much nicer than your run-of-the-mill trigger style ones. The amount of even, unflexing pressure you can apply is just game-changing. But they're not cheap, at about $100 a pair. So I make do with just one set. But man, are they worth it. So a minute ago I mentioned that I have a lot of faith in tight bond. But it's not unlimited, so just for some extra little peace of mind, I decided to lock each of the tongues in their respective grooves with some stainless steel 18 gauge narrow crown staples. After the sides were complete, it occurred to me that I forgot one important cut. The grooves for the rear panels, so that meant running the now glued up pieces through a table saw. A bit of an awkward move, but hey, it worked. That adjustment done and we're on to the front and back. Both top horizontal pieces need to have one side beveled to match the roof pitch. I'll dial in 10 degrees and make that rip cut. Because I want to give these longer horizontal pieces connecting the two sides something with a little more bite, I'll be drilling some pocket holes. My favorite low effort way to join two pieces of wood. Seriously, if you don't have a jig, get one ASAP. Aside from my drill and driver, they're probably my most used tool. You'll use it on just about every project. I'll place an Amazon link to this one, the Craig R3 below. I'll get a small commission if you use it. Temporarily holding the pieces together before running in the screws, we've got a cheap angle clamp. I think I picked this one up for around 10 bucks. I wouldn't call these a must-have for any DIYer, but they do come in handy from time to time. Now here's a pretty satisfying moment, the time when you get to put a bunch of stuff together and really see a lot of progress all at once. If you've been careful with your cuts, things should all just fit. After the main body was done, it occurred to me that I completely forgot about one thing. The opening to install our ele electronics. You know, the temperature controller and fan assembly. I had meant to use the cedar panel I made earlier in place of one of the polycarbonate panels. But I didn't. To correct, I need to remove a portion of one. To accomplish this, I'll use my oscillating multi-tool to plunge cut. Next up, it's time to begin work on the lids and doors. I'll make these much the same way that I did with the rest of the greenhouse. Tongues, grooves, and panels. So it's back to the table saw. After cuts were made, I went ahead and again used my parallel clamps to squeeze everything together. So right here, I've got a little bit of a cluster on my hands. Most of the time, if you've got a good dry fit, you'll also have a good wet fit. But for some reason, I just couldn't get everything together as nicely as I had just a few minutes earlier. I suppose it's pretty easy to get flustered. You've got glue drying and things aren't working, but I always like to remind myself that the absolute worst case is that one or all of the rails and styles would need to be remade. It's not the end of the world. Also, another reason I really like Tight Bond 3 is the fact that it's got a nice long open time, so you've got a little wiggle room after you put it down. The next morning, I wasn't thrilled with the way some of the joints came together. I went ahead and used the old standby, DAP plastic wood, to fill in the problem areas. I'm a big fan of this product. It sticks really well and is acetone based, so it dries nice and quickly. 
It also seems to hold up pretty well outdoors, so it's my go-to. After giving it a little sand down action and mock assembling everything, I found a bit of a problem. Something is out of square. Why? Who knows? But here's how we can correct that. I'll line up the two sides and front of the panel to the greenhouse frame. In effect, moving the error to the back. Using a pen or whatever else you've got, go ahead and trace it out. Here, it tapers from about 3 sixteenths of an inch to nothing. This is what we want to remove. Then, using my temporary work table as a straight edge, I'll index that line I just traced and use my router with a flush trim bit to remove the excess. To finish it off, I'll use my random orbit to reapply the factory roundover. Back over at the greenhouse and we've now got a lid that sits square with the front and side and doesn't hang over the back, which would definitely make attaching the hinges a bit tough. Speaking of those, I'm just using some simple stainless steel ones that I picked up from the big orange box that I love to hate, but that is conveniently close to my house. In order to seal things up, I'm going to use DAP Ultra Clear Solvent Based Caulk. It's very similar to what you might find in a tube of Lexel. Unlike silicone, both this DAP product and Lexel will actually stick to plastic. They both claim to avoid yellowing, but I'll believe that when I see it. It's definitely a little tougher to work with than silicone. You'll need a high thrust gun to run it and it skins over quickly, so work fast. I'm only going to worry about the outside, because in my experience, anything that can keep water out can also keep it in. If something does get inside, it should be able to escape on the other side. To provide a little more storage space inside, I'm using a closet made wire shelf. I know, I know, not exactly what this product is intended for, but hear me out on this one. It's a vinyl coated steel, so it should do all right with moisture, provided I touch up the ends after cutting. Ultimately, I just wanted something I could install quickly. If it doesn't work, it doesn't work, and I'm out 12 bucks while I figure something else out. With the shelf mounted, I was ready to move into the garden. Cue my live-in on-demand helper to help with the lifting and we're in place. Because my yard has a bit of a nasty slope to it, I had to level with some concrete pavers. I'll likely have to go back and place some kind of skirting around the bottom to deal with the now existing gap. So here it is sitting in its new home. I think it looks pretty decent. You know, it's like every project. There's things you wish you would have done differently, but as long as the final result gets you close to what you had envisioned and you learn something along the way, I'd call it a success. After the girlfriend placed the first round of plants, it looked even better. But speaking of unforeseen problems, one of those arose later that night and presented itself the next morning. You see, we had a bit of rain and well, I didn't properly plan for drainage on top. In an attempt to mitigate, I'm going to route a relief channel on the eave edge. To be clear, this is a poor substitute for properly planned water management. After routing, I placed a small piece of caulk backer rod in between the polycarbonate sheet and the frame and used some more clear sealant to run over everything. Again, this is really not an ideal situation, but I needed to do something. After another rain, take a look at the corrected versus uncorrected side. So at the moment, it appears to be working. The last piece of this puzzle is the greenhouse electronics enclosure, what I'll call the e-house from now on. Because the fan and thermostat aren't really outdoor pieces of equipment, I needed to build a shelter. Just because something is outside doesn't mean it needs to be outdoors. After I ripped and sanded the back panel off camera, I went ahead and cut out the hole for the fan with the multi-tool. This doesn't have to be perfect because we've got a big flange covering it. I'll place a link to the temperature control components I used in the description below. They're associate links for which the channel will earn a small commission. Use is greatly appreciated. Fast forward and it's time to install. I didn't bother filming the rest of the e-house build because I assume anyone thinking about a project like this can put together what is essentially a birdhouse. 
but I did take the time to finish it. I wanted it to look like a mini version of the shed I'm working on, which itself is a mini version of my house. I had already installed some thread inserts on the greenhouse, so installing was just a matter of bolting into place. Not wanting to repeat the water management mistakes made earlier, I went ahead and flashed the enclosure. Clear sealant on the back and screws with neoprene bonded washers on the front. Should keep water from getting in between the greenhouse and the e-house. Here's what it looks like on the inside. I'd rate my cord management skills as poor to quite poor. Basically, a temp probe is mounted center and when it reaches 85 degrees, it starts to power vent. The controller also has the ability to simultaneously control a heater, so herbs in the winter are a distinct possibility. Also, as luck would have it, after I installed, we once again got some rain, but this time, I didn't find a problem. It's looking pretty wet on the outside and pretty dry on the inside. All right, everyone, that should about do it. Any questions, concerns, complaints, recommendations, or other issues you may have should be addressed below in the comments. If you found this video helpful, a like, share, or sub is appreciated. If not, go ahead, hit that thumbs down button. Okay, we'll talk real soon.